and you can go to the worksheets to see the limitations, but it's pretty straightforward that it was a 60% of AGI uh, limitation. AGI being not the income number typically, but remember most of these phase outs are based on the AGI. So if I had any above the line deductions, then they're usually, the, they're based on the AGI or a modification of the AGI, that being the, kind of like the baseline when we have these phase outs. Now also remember that we would of course want to have the documentation uh, from the charitable organizations uh, in general, and we don't attach those to the return usually, but instead if there was an audit, we want to have those ready and available so that we can have the evidence related to them. Okay, so the other common thing we might have if I go back on over here and say we have our gifts, these are gifts by check. Uh, if you made any gift of 250 or more, see instructions, and then 12 other than cash or check. So if you made any gift of 250 or more, see the instructions, you must attach form uh, 8283 if over $500. So if they're under $500, you might be able to get away with populating it right directly in there. So let's go back on over, for example. All right, so let's go back. And say that we're gonna say, boom, let's get rid of that one. And say we have the non-cash contributions. And you can see right here, it says use screen 26 for total non-cash contributions over $500. So no deduction is allowed for contributions of clothing or household items that are not in good use condition or better. So you, again, that's a hard to determine exactly what that means, good use condition or better. Uh, in addition, a deduction for any item with minimal uh, monetary value may be denied. So if we're under that threshold, then I can go here and put, the, put that item in and there's the, there's the 300. Otherwise, we would have to go to that form 8283. So let's look at the form 8283, shall we? So I can go down here and jump there. Let's go to 8283. And this is gonna be non-cash uh, charitable contributions. Attach one or more forms 8283 to your tax return if you claim a total deduction of $500 for all contributed property. So then you've got your information down below, name of, of the donee, information on the donated property, if donated property is a vehicle, so on, description, and so on. So I'm gonna to jump to the data input. It won't let me jump to the data input. Well, let's do it this way. I'm gonna go back on over here and I'm gonna say, let's then say it's gonna to go to screen 26. So I could find screen 26 and that's, I could do that by going here and say, I'm gonna say non-cash contributions, screen 26. And so now I need the name of the organization. And so let's say it'd be a good old Goodwill, Goodwill. I'm just gonna make up the organization. We need the address of the organization. Typically we would, ha we would have to have some kind of receipt from the organization. Usually the receipt will be fairly blah, mundane, saying, hey, here's our organization name. Here's a description of what you gave household goods or something like that, right? So deduct amount determined uh, from Schedule C, taxpayer deduct, uh, did, uh, delete this year. Now I'm going to say description of and condition of property description. So I'm just going to say, I'm just going to be very ge generic household goods, something like that description and condition of property continued. Obviously you can get more descript on what it is that was uh, contributed vehicle identification number. If it was a vehicle that was contributed, rules can be a little bit different on contribution of a vehicle date of contribution. Let's say 06, uh, 22. Obviously it has to be in this year, the taxable year, uh, date, date acquired. I, we may not know the date required because it was sometime before that. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a negative 01, uh, zero, zero. And so that'll put a various, I think, in the software for this particular software. Uh, how you acquired it? Was it purchase, gift, inheritance, exchange? I'm just going to say purchased. Donors cost or basis? We may not know that. So we could try to estimate what we paid for it when we bought it, possibly when it was new. So I'm going to say it was, let's say, uh, let's say it was $2,000 when it was new and the fair market value. So again, how do we know the fair market value? It's gonna be difficult to say. You might do some kind of calculation with it and say, well, uh, and you could appraise, there's a lot more appraisal tools that you can kind of kind of use these days to get a fair market value. But if I took 2000, I'm just gonna say divided by five, 
and say that you know it's been a long time or whatever it's been i'm going to say fair market value uh based on the item's selection high based on i'll say medium fair market method determined then we can try to give the method appraisal thrift shop value catalog uh comparable sales so i'll say like uh comparable sales con or maybe a thrift shop value let's say and then uh, contribution deduction. Oh, this is an override and the AGI limit. So I'm gonna put the fair market value up here at 400. So that's why I'm gonna put the fair market value. All right, so if I pull that over then, this is what we have thus far in the software. We've got the added form 8283, which is now being populated. We've got the name address, uh, household good as the description. And then down here, the date of contribution should be in 2022, various. Notice I put a negative number in the date in this particular software that puts various because obviously we might have a bunch of bag of goods or whatever that we gave or something. We're gonna say that we purchased them. Uh, donors, donors cost, I said 2000 and then 400 for the fair value. This determination of the fair value is of course subjective because the only way you really know what the fair market value is is if you actually sold the stuff which you're not doing you're giving it away so so coming up with an appropriate fair value number is agonizingly <laughs> painful to try to figure out and then we said it was the thrift shop uh value so this of course then pulls into the schedule a so if i go to the schedule a then and we move on down to the gifts to charity now we've got the 400 uh, that is down here. It's under the 500. So I, I probably should have put a value over 500 to make it to make it So we had to do that Let's <laughs> put 600. So there's the 600. So that pulls over uh, like so So there's that one and then the other thing that could come up is you might have a carryover now the carryovers are not likely because uh, like we like I saw before when we when we had too much and we had to carry it over let's let's first look at that scenario again so if i go back to my income on deduction on the schedule a and we said that we deducted like eighty thousand or whatever and so now we were we deducted way too much or more than is going to be allowed and uh it restricted us but i changed it to eighty thousand up top so then the, then the question, well, what am I going to, what do I, do I just lose that carryover? Uh, do I lose that deductibility? Well, no, normally you get to carry it over. So now you've got uh, line 13 would be a carryover from a prior year carried over into this year. And if we got a carry, if we deducted too much this year, then theoretically we would be able to carry it over into the next year. Now here's a worksheet summary of it. We have the 80,000 and then the 600 and then the carryover before uh, before conversion to NOL amount. So this is the carryover to next year, the 20,000 and the 600. So that's how the carryover would work. Now note that if you're doing this in practice, uh, if you take on a new client and the new client has a more complex return, which I would be, I would think anyone that has a schedule A because they're probably more high income individuals would have a more complex return that it might be worthwhile then to spend the added time and possibly money to get off on the right foot by taking the prior year tax return and populating that information into the the prior year software in this case 2021 so that you can that you can input the rollover properly into the current year let the software help to calculate the rollover and then double check it instead of instead of trying to populate all the rollover information into the current software so that's just a, a, a recommendation i'm going to go back on over and remove this one and let's remove this for now and say okay let's say there was a rollover from the prior year in the schedule a and so i'm going to say there was a rollover let's jump to that data input and i'll just do the 50 and then prior year let's do it here and let's say there was last year we didn't get to deduct you know three thousand because we were over the over the limit then this one's pulling in from the prior year so those rollovers get a little bit messy because of the timing you know the timing differences and whatnot 
So oftentimes, again, the software is quite helpful 